Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll be starting shortly, just waiting another minute for participants to join, and then we will kick off. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. There's, there's still people coming in, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Randall Krantz. I am a senior advisor on decarbonization at the Global Maritime Forum, and I'm working with the Getting to Zero Coalition and specifically with my colleague uh, Emma Skolf Christensen, working to run the Fuels and Technologies Workstream. This webinar is part of a series that we're doing. It was initially a myth-busting series of webinars, but it's, it's become much more than that. And uh, so this is a, um, uh, an exciting process that we have that allows us to engage with a range of different stakeholders from within the maritime industry and beyond on a range of different topics that are relevant to decarbonization of shipping. So the topic today is an overview of new fuels and total cost of operation. Um, just a few housekeeping pieces before we get started. So um, even though we're online, this is still an interactive session. We'll be doing some polling and we'll be asking you to um, use the chat function to ask questions to our panelists. Um, all participants who are not speakers are automatically muted. That keeps things simple. Um, so we'll have the interaction via the, the chat button, as I mentioned, or the chat uh, function. Um, we will be monitoring the, the Zoom chat and bringing questions and comments um, to the attention, to my attention and to the attention of our panelists. Um, and some of the questions will be answered directly during the, um, uh, through the Zoom chat by um, uh, myself, my colleagues, or the Zoom, uh, our, our panelists who are with us today. Um, and then, so uh, similar to a physical meeting, um, I will request that you be present. So, you know, set your phone down, um, remove your other distractions and uh, join us, be present and join us in, in what will be an interesting conversation today. Uh, I am excited about this conversation and I certainly hope you share my enthusiasm. So before we get started and I introduce the panelists, what we'll do is we're gonna do a quick poll. This is the first time we've tried a poll in one of these. And the goal of this is just to familiarize um, ourselves with who's on the call um, what do we represent? So I'm gonna ask my colleague, Emma, if she can share that poll. There we go. And so there's a, you need to scroll down on the poll and um, the first two questions, you select one of, a, of each and it allows us to see what kind of sectors uh, we're looking at and then hit that submit button. We'll be able to collect those answers and then display them and have a little idea of, of who we've got on the call. Um, we're working on experimenting and, and, and exploring how we can make these types of sessions a little bit more interactive, which, uh, which I think would be benefit to everybody. So um, not sure how that polling works, but we give it another minute uh, and then we'll uh, show this. We've got about half the people who have figured out the poll it looks like. Um, so if you haven't done that yet, that should pop up on your screen. And uh, in a couple of clicks, you can tell us what sector you're from, there's an other box in case we forgot one, uh, where you're dialing in from geographically and whether you're a member of the Getting to Zero or your organization rather is a member of the Getting to Zero Coalition. So we'll just wait and get those polling results. Let me go ahead and display those. <clears throat> Okay, there we go. So we've, I, I like to say it codes it in red. I guess that's the winner. Um, so across energy, machinery, um, ship owners, uh, and then uh, a healthy dose of others, some think tanks, NGOs. Okay, so 
um, some distribution. It's nice to know that we do have, it's probably, you know, one or two ports and uh, one or two on the banking side that we've got as well, which will help us round out our conversation and make sure we have some questions covering those sides as well. And then uh, majority in Europe, which is unsurprising given the, the time zone, a few thankfully, uh, thank you for calling in from Asia where it's uh, most likely late and uh, early in North America. Uh, we do try to position these so they're in the middle of the day here so that we can get as much reach as we can. And then we have a majority of members of the Getting to Zero Coalition, but some uh, who are, are not, and hopefully you can learn more. And if you're interested in learning more following this, you can feel free to, to reach out. So thanks everybody for participating in that poll. What I'd like to do now is introduce our speakers. We have uh, four speakers today. Dr. Alexandra Ebbinghaus, um, who's the lead, uh, the Maritime Strategic Project Lead at Shipping and Maritime Strategy for Shell. Dr. Tristan Smith, reader at UCL Energy Institute and director of University Marine Advisory Services, UMass. Ludovic uh, Lafineau, policy manager at, uh, for Maritime Aviation and Ports at Hydrogen Europe. And uh, Tora Longva, principal consultant at DNV GM. So, I want to thank our panelists for joining us today because it's, um, it's, uh, it's really nice that we are, have such a breadth of different ideas that, um, that we're gonna be able to discuss today. So the webinar today, just to frame it, is um, we're really exploring how projected costs of zero carbon fuels uh, for shipping are being modeled and compared, what assumptions we're using to, to make those, and how our understanding of the, the science, the technology, the economic impacts, um, how all these things come together. So in particular, um, we're gonna be exploring some, how some of the options compare from a total cost of ownership perspective. We'll be diving in uh, a little bit into what do we mean by total cost of ownership, which is obviously important to understand. And then uh, we'll explore a little bit about how different factors across the fuels life cycle might be influencing their projected costs. And, and I think we'll be asking some broader questions around um, you know, uh, of what use is this or modeling exercises and, and what uh, kind of outputs do they, do, they, um, do they provide us with and how we can use those. So what I'll be doing is asking each of my uh, speakers to, to provide us with some kind of framing uh, remarks um, with, with a couple of slides for about five minutes each. And then we'll come back to them with some, some broader questions uh, after which we'll be opening up the floor to questions from the participants. So if they're talking and you have a question as they're talking, just pop it into that chat box. We'll make sure that it, uh, it get, gets in there. For questions that don't get answered during the session, we will be keeping those kind of as uh, in our back pocket, so to speak, and we'll be um, answering them offline and making sure that they're included in the summary from this session. So with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Alexandra. Alexandra, thank you. Thank you, Randall. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I thought it would be useful really to start off with the definition of the total cost of ownership. And, you know, looking at Wikipedia, which is of course the answer to everything, is total cost of ownership is defined as a financial estimate intended to help buyers and owners to determine the direct and indirect cost of a product or system. So when you think about it, it goes beyond what people usually think, you know, the capital cost. What are all the other aspects which are going into it? Insurance, finance, spare parts, um, training required, downtime time. It, it's a really detailed assessment. And I think from a shipping point of view, the most recent application might have been the uh, IMO 2020. What are the different options a ship owner had to meet the low sulfur? Uh, regulation <clears throat> and comparing, you know, let's say going for low super fuel oil, going for scrubber, or you know, going for low carb, uh, low carb, sorry, uh, a different fuel uh, like LNG. But really, you know, making a decision on investment is is really then based on a lot of detailed information and information which is very well known. So when we look at future fuels. How can we apply the concept on something where there is not really a lot of information available? So focusing on one element, the future fuel costs, I think what we have to realize, it's really more of a comparative modeling approach. 
if you're thinking from a fuel supplier point of view, really what the main output is we're looking for are the production costs over an energy unit, so a dollar per megajoule approach. And really what you need at this point, and the only thing you can really do is to have a simplified model. And the simplified, I mean, is you have a limited scope you can really cover. Uh, clearly, you need to focus on the technology costs, but what you might have to do is exclude owner's costs. So owner's costs are permitting, land cost, um, infrastructure cost, um, design cost, feed analysis, etc., which can be relatively significant. But basically, you know, you can't really look at it very specifically for the difference because you're doing a very high analysis. You might include it as a factor or you might exclude it completely. Thinking about it, we are looking at a global industry with global uh, locations. But the location factor itself in the analysis may, by necessity, be limited to renewable energy costs. So what is your wind solar cost for, you know, as a main input, but you might not want um, able to consider, you know, what is the cost of building or operating something in the US compared to South America, compared to Africa or specific locations. So it needs to be realized that you probably need a simplified model, but how simplified it is. And one of the big aspects with regard to zero carbon fuels is really the con uh, conversion efficiency. What we have is starting point, generally wind and solar, which are very intermittent. And you're combining it with basically a technology which is working on a continuous basis. And in some cases, uh, specifically ammonia, if you use a Harbour Bosch process, um, the fischer tropsch process for doing synthetic fuels. So how do you combine those? And, and, and this has become then a, really an optimization question. Um, combination of different sources of renewable power, wind, solar, concentrated solar power, hydroelectrics, whatever. But the, the point is you have a number of different solutions, but we don't really have a lot of information how these go together because at the moment nobody is producing them. So you might have a limited data set based on very small scale to actually think where's the optimum because you could invest a lot of capex to get a continuous operation or you say I'm actually thinking of a lower throughput by not operating on a continuous basis. So all these can show us uncertainties need to be considered really by a sensitivity analysis to include your high low in estimates. And one of the other <clears throat> aspects really is what data sources do you have? Um, literature generally, technology providers, but uh, you always have to consider technology providers uh, tend to have their own preferences and may be rather optimistic on the on the opportunity space of their technology. But really what we're aiming for is to have a comparative analysis. It needs to be on the same year. There's no point in comparing something of the cost of one fuel today with the cost of another fuel in 2030. But also considering the development, the maturity, what you might want to look at how things are developing from today, 2030, 2040, 2050, whatever. It's clearly important that you have the same approach on cost assumptions, same cost of financing, for example. But the challenge is really comparing technologies of varying maturity. We do know that with experience costs come down, but how fast are we generating that experience? And does the relationship actually hold true? Because you could have a technology where as demand increases, the resource costs are actually going up. Biofuels would be, biomass would be one you know, of, of those examples where at the moment something may be seen as waste, but as soon as more people don't see it as waste, the costs are expected to go up. And I think one of the fundamental things is do never mix studies because the underlying assumptions will be different. So it's very dangerous to say study A produces a cost for say hydrogen of X dollars per megajoule, and I take a different study which shows that ammonia is more expensive or less expensive. 
it's, you know, that's not really a very useful approach. But even if you have a fuel cost on an energy unit, really what is the value of that information? One thing is, I think it's important to also consider in the regulatory framework. And with that, I mean, how is the CO2 emissions associated with a different fuel being assessed? Does it make a difference or doesn't it make a difference on, on the way to tank, way to wake basis? The other one is, it is only an input to the total cost of ownership to the end user. But can you actually model it? It will be very different. So do you have the test case where you could say you're just modeling a specific tanker, bull carrier, container ship? So how do you link it together? And then from a fuel supplier point of view, we're not just looking at shipping. We're looking at a customer demand across the sectors. So really from current situation, it's not a tool to make an investment decision, but really the main application is to identify front risers and also those which are rather more challenging options. It's identifying which are the key cost drivers, differentiators, the, you know, what is actually making the difference? What, where do the costs can come down and which cost has the greatest impact? So one thing is it's a global production. What is the cost of transport of uh, liquid hydrogen compared to an ammonia? And does that actually make a big impact on the overall cost? But the application then is to really feed it into the strategy development and identify a plan going forward. And what is important really is it's a continuous refinement of a model. As we generate more data, it actually allows us to be more precise. And you might then consider going into specific locations and actually looking at specific cases. So with this, I would like to hand over to Tristan to actually look at some specific modeling. Thank you, Alexandra, and thank you for making the handover for me. If you stop sharing your screen, then there we go. We'll get Tristan on. And uh, Tristan, over to you to talk about some of the specifics from your experience and uh, what we can learn from those. Thanks, Randall and Alexandra, and I hope that's working, <coughs> that you can both hear me and see some slides. No confirmation. You're yes, good. Okay. that's working. Thank you. Um, so to, by way of introduction, I'm a researcher at University College London. We have a group that has focused on the decarbonisation of the shipping industry, and we also operate under a brand name UMass in conjunction with a private company that does advisory services. Um, the work that I'm presenting here is not all my own work. There's a big team behind it. And in particular, we've worked a lot with Lloyd's Register, and I'll point out some of the overlaps there in a second. The type of work that we do is best summarized by these two pictures. We've looked at the past, at the, tr at the trends over the last decade or two and led the authorship of the third IMO greenhouse gas study and the inventory work in the fourth IMO greenhouse gas study. And we also work to try and understand scenarios and run a number of models that can explore the types of questions and applications that Alexandra was just referring to. And I'm going to focus on one of those models um, developed in co collaboration with Lloyd's Register and which um, has taken this kind of framing question of what's the total cost of operation. And I'll share how we have defined that because not as inclusive of all of the components that was on um, that were on Alexandra's slide. Um, this slide hopefully summarizes that we start at the feedstock price input. We don't model the photovoltaic deployment. We just take an assumption of the cost of renewable electricity. Um, we do model the production process and all of the components within it for which there's an energy trans transition or conversion of some sort and what the capital costs and operating costs of those would be, what their energy requirements are, what their efficiencies are, so how much is lost in that process to end up with a basket of candidate fuels which are described in the middle of the slide. And then we look at the implementation on board a ship so we consider a number of different machinery options so anything from a fuel cell to an internal combustion solution in combination with storage um, of any one of those candidate fuels. And that allows us to estimate what the total change in the capex might be, what the running costs and operating costs could be, and also how 
the capacity of the ship to carry cargo might be influenced. And that's a point which relates to the fact that many of these options have lower energy density than the fuels we use today. So could end up displacing cargo capacity um, in order to, to achieve equivalent ranges or um, endurances. So all of that's taken into account in the way that we model a total additional cost on top of the baseline costs of operating any given ship today. We do do sensitivity studies for exactly the reason that Alexander just uh, Alexander just um, suggested that there are many uncertainties in the inputs in the modeling assumptions. And uh, unfortunately, in a four minute presentation, I can't run you through those. So I'm gonna choose one and you can decide whether I've been biased in the one that I selected. This is a high price scenario. So that's um, some information that we've got a given set of input price assumptions. And we're only looking at one particular vessel here, an 8,000 dead weight ton um, bulk carrier and the total annualized additional cost. So a lot of the capex has been annualized over a period of time, and we're just looking at a slice of it associated one year of operation. The slide that you've got shows three basic families of fuels that are being assessed here, and uh, I've grouped them, but given them colors, which are very counterintuitive. So the fuels that are often referred to as blue, natural gas and CCS are unhelpfully colored green. The fuels that are often referred to as green uh, are actually colored blue, the e-fuels that come from electrolysis with hydrogen, and then biofuels are for some reason pink. Um, so those are the three groups. Now, there is an element of this graph that I just need to explain, which is that the cost of production is what has driven the input prices for the e-fuels and the natural gas and CCS fuels. But for the reason that Alexandra alluded to just now, the, sustainable, uh, the supply of sustainable biofuel, we actually model a scenario where supply across the economy drives up prices for biofuels. So that's not cost of production increasing over time for biofuels. It's to do with the supply constraint and the less and the input assumptions we make about that. The time scale on this graph is from 2020 out to 2050, and the y-axis gives you the total cost in dollars, um, million dollars in case it's not scary enough. Um, biofuel, uh, these are some of the points that sort of occur to us as we digest the information, uh, that biofuel increases in price over time. So it might be attractive in an init initial period, but it has a disadvantage over time. Um, Natural gas and CCS, so blue fuels, um, appear in this analysis to be consistently cheaper than e-fuels. That's because of the given assumptions we make behind this about respective levels of gas and electricity price. Ammonia of those e-fuels and blue fuels, ammonia is the one that is consistently at the bottom of the family of fuels. Um, it's cheaper than synthetic hydrocarbons on a total cost of operation basis in this analysis. And it's typically of the order of 20 to 50 percent cheaper than the next cheapest option and those are often very closely specified as hydrogen or synthetic methane um, given the assumptions in this analysis um, and uh, that margin that difference between ammonia's price competitiveness or cost competitiveness and the others only increases over time so as we as we move to cheaper input feedstock prices the gas and the electricity the, the, the spread remains similar, um, but the overall absolute magnitude comes down, which means that the, that the spread as a percentage relative terms between options advantages the cheapest option. And that's, that's a paper that we uh, published with Lloyd's Register in March. The, there have been another couple of papers uh, since then, which I've been trying to understand whether we are saying similar things or not. And I hope that this doesn't um, misrepresent those other pieces. And it certainly doesn't preclude the fact that there are many other studies. So I've just looked in this slide at the IEA's latest energy technology perspectives published quite recently and DNB GL's recent uh, 2020 Maritime Outlook, which is very hot off the press. And uh, one of the things that I noticed when I looked and read those studies was that there is quite a lot of convergence. I mean, our studies, have been published on a rolling basis for several years and were quite uh, different from some of the other perspectives in the industry three or four years ago. They're now much more similar. We're all more or less saying that the total cost of operation increase um, for HSFO, um, uh, sorry, HFO or LSFO uh, will be material. There isn't gonna be a zero carbon fuel at the moment that we can see, which is gonna be cheaper than oil. Uh, I think that's stating the obvious. Um, I think all of those three studies are more or less saying that ammonia is likely dominant in the long run. 
that's slightly less clear cut than the DMVGL study where some of the scenarios do point to methanol as being the answer. But I think it's the phrasing here is essentially that there's a good likelihood that of all the candidates, ammonia is commonly uh, uh, arriving as, as, the, as the most competitive, but it needs wider emissions and safety needs to be answered. Um, internal combustion is looking least cost relative to the other comp the other options like fuel cells that doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, do lots of work on fuel cells there are many other advantages or reasons for that to be an interesting long run solution and that shipping is likely to need large volumes of low or zero hydrogen so so there are some really common feedstocks to to almost any of the pathways that we talk about and um that's an easy point to make about convergence but there is also just because it would be fun if there wasn't some divergence between some of the studies, uh, particularly around the assumptions they make about rate of decarbonisation. And here, you know, we, we're quite constant on our expectation on that, partly driven by the IMO's initial strategy, but also by, by the climate science, whereas IEA, because of the share of emission reduction responsibility they give to shipping, as well as their framing, because they take a quite a, an unambitious framing of two degrees for a lot of their work, um, are much less ambitious about the rate of decarbonisation of shipping. Um, DMV, as I said, are a bit agnostic because they model several different rates of decarbonisation or zero dates. Um, we all make quite different assumptions about sustainable bioenergy availability. We are probably the least optimistic, and so we assume there's less available than many others. Uh, we have different assumptions about the timescale to transition. That mainly comes from the rate of decarbonisation point, but it also comes of, you know, when do you have to do stuff? how important the cumulative emissions will happen this decade. And we all have different assumptions about the flexibility of different machinery uh, or fuel pathways, which might be an important consideration for the transition, but is less important for the end result. So that's what I wanted to draw out of what we've done um, and uh, pass over to the next speaker. Thanks, Tristan. There was one question from Joanna Sheila to our panelists, but I think this was a specific reference to some of the numbers you presented. She said, do these numbers refer to the total cost or to additional costs compared to LS, uh, FO or MGO or some fossil baseline? It's additional cost. Sorry for not making that clear. So, so you have a basic cost, which I think is, um, I can't, sorry, it's not on the top of my head. I think it's of the order of 10 million, and those are premiums on top of that. Okay, great, thanks. Um, you mentioned the DNV model, so uh, we'll now shift over to Tora. Tristan, if you want to stop sharing your screen, and Tora um, from DNV will talk to us a little bit about their model, which is, as you suggest, half the press. I think it came out um, on the 22nd, so just last week. So, Tora, over to you. Thank you. Let's see if I can share my screen. And there we go. Um, thank you, and um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, to this webinar. So I'm I'm Tore Longwa. I work in DMGL, uh, one of the lead authors for an annual study that we have been doing over the last uh, four years called the Maritime Forecast to 2050, which is actually passed part of a larger uh, portfolio of uh, studies that we're doing across different sectors and uh, I kind of I think yeah, Tristan was to the point here that you know our model has been developed over the years now so now it's kind of picked up a lot of the things that we were not uh, having as part of the of the first uh, modeling so it, it also goes to show that you know, what you include in the model uh, is, is very important for uh, for the results so that's also what I'm intend to talk about today, um, uh, taking a little high level view, what, when I read the study, uh, um, what I look for, what are the important aspects that you should look for when, uh, when evaluating the impact of a study. So I divided into to four uh, things to consider. First of all, um, what is the model about? Um, we have a model that um, uh, it's quite extensive, been developed over the years, and the intention is to capture the interaction between multiple parameters. So, so what what's the scope of the model? That's the first thing. The second part is how do you capture the sensitivity and uncertainties? So scenario uh, analysis is one of them. There are other some other techniques that I won't go into here, but. Um, 
we have chosen to have quite a lot of scenarios due to the large uh, uncertainty that we see. The third part is the input uh, to the model. What are the assumptions behind it? Um, and then uh, kind of related to that, but I put it up as a separate point that there are assumptions uh, that you have to read very careful to, to understand what what's, um, there are some limitations. So taking our study now as say, uh, kind of how, how do they fit into this picture? So first of all, we have, we have a model that's become quite extensive now. Uh, it takes into account uh, a lot of different input data, everything from ship specific uh, data and operational profiles, uh, technology prices, uh, impact of technologies, the same with fuels, what kind of regulations are there out there. And what the model do, uh, very specifically, it projects uh, tank to wake CO2 emissions uh, based on a um, technology and fuel uptake, which again is based on an investment decision. decision. So, so that's what is due. Um, so all the, you know, all the assumption or the input that you put into is uh, centered around this investment decision and that determines how much technology and fuel will be taken up. And that again gives the CO2 emissions. Um, and then on the, on the uh, sensitivity part, um, if you go for the last year study, we only have four scenarios, uh, three, uh, no, actually three scenarios. And in our experience with that, with that we didn't, didn't quite capture uh, all the different possibilities out there. Um, we also got kind of, when we presented this, um, at least my impression was that, okay, it will be a, a ammonia. It will be that and that. And then, but that was only one of a lot of assumptions. So this year we went <laughs> a completely different direction. We have 30 scenarios. And the three uh, or four, uh, three key uncertainties that we see, um, first of all, what will be the decarbonization path? What's the regulatory ambitions? Uh, and this is uh, also what Tristan mentioned that we are quite agnostic there. We have three different pathways with the, uh, three, um, each with two different set of policy measures that you can apply. So it's kind of an assumption, but we want to see what is the technology and fuel uptake given our decarbonization in 2040 or decarbonization later this century or nothing happening at all. The same with the fuel prices. We have in the in the background what kind of called a sub model, uh, looking at fuel prices. That was also something that we did this year. Uh, I think it's very similar uh, in in principle with, with the model that was uh, presented by by Tristan, looking at the the um, uh, primary energy sources and how you process process them into different fuels. And uh, the, the third one is the seaborne trade demand because that's also very important for the absolute CO2 emissions. And if you have a high growth, you need to do more uh, technology uptake to manage the, the transition. Um, and that also um, part of one scenario is based on the greenhouse gas study, the third one, and another one on our own modeling done by the, the central team on energy transition. Uh, and then we come to, uh, input on the model. And I think this is also very important because that's, uh, that's where the, uh, the, the model cannot capture, the only capture is what you put into it. So how do you derive on the different technology, uh, the cost of the different technology, the applicability on different ship segments, uh, um, how, much, how much does it cost to install a uh, LNG tank compared to an ammonia tank and so on. Uh, is, uh, is everything in, in search of modeling. Uh, seaborne trade also uh, important, but that's, uh, I don't, it's, it's more on a high level. Um, we have a high growth and a low growth. So, but of course, deep into the details, there are some sort of dif differences on how much will the container trade grow? what will happen with the energy trades, uh, do it um, carry around crude oil and, and gas in the future and so on. And then we have the regulations, which is also can have an input. We wanted to look at, will we have fundamental different uh, results with the carbon price compared to a technical and operational requirement. 
which uh, gave some interesting insights. And then finally, we have the assumptions that um, uh, a lot of assumptions in here, but uh, kind of what's what's key to, to know about. Um, there's no restriction of fuel availability. So uh, our study and, and in impact of that is that you should read our study as if you're going to manage this, you will need uh, so, so much of a biomethanol or so, so much of uh, electro ammonia in order to manage this. Um, of course, in, in future, we might put into more restrictions on availability, but, but this year we, we time didn't allow it. And also it's very difficult to do. Uh, so it's, uh, it's for a future study. Uh, and also we are assuming that the fuels that are provided are carbon neutral, well to wake. No, uh, sorry, well, it should be read uh, well to tank. Which, which also um, are zero emissions um, tank to wake. Uh, but that's also reflected in the pricing uh, of the fuel. So we have assumed that the sources uh, of energy, primary energy is actually uh, renewable electricity or um, fossil fuel with CCS and so on. So although not completely zero carbon, it, it's uh, uh, in principle carbon neutral. Um, and of course, comes at a higher cost. So I think I will leave it at uh, at that point. I think we will have interesting discussions as we move forward as well. So thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Tora, for sharing those insights. And it's uh, it's nice to see um, yeah what kind of a, a, a deep exploration looks like uh, like in real life and up close. Um, with that, I'd like to hand over to Ludovic. Um, Ludovic, obviously, you're not coming at this from a broad perspective, and certainly not from a technology neutral perspective. You're coming at this from the perspective of, of hydrogen Europe, where you've uh, you've done some modeling uh, specific to the maritime sector in terms of hydrogen as a fuel. And, um, and maybe you could uh, share some of your thoughts with us, and then we'll uh, we'll get to some of the questions that have been coming in through the through the chat. Um, for those who are listening, please continue to use the chat, pop some questions in there, and we'll get to those after. So Ludovic, over to you. You're on mute, Ludovic. And you're sharing your OneDrive screen, which may or may not be intentional. Is it OK now? You're off mute, but the screen that we're seeing is still your, your kind of OneDrive index, and I can see the uh, file that you're looking to show, but in name only. So you just you've, I think you've got the wrong window selected. So maybe unshare and share again. Okay. Um, and now it's coming. Yes, correct. Yeah, put that on full screen. We're good to go. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, um, before starting, so I'm the, the policy manager from Hydrogen Europe for maritime ports and aviation. Um, and we are talking about the fuel cost for, for the shipping side and I'm also dealing with the port side. So we have more and more members from, from ports um, or people ports joining our association because that's also an extremely important element uh, when talking about the, the, the cost of um, for the maritime sector to, to, to trend, for the transition to uh, sustainable fuels. Um, just a bit of an explanation of who we are, because that will explain a bit, because we also have developed a model where we come from. We focus, of course, mostly on hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuels, uh, but the Hydrogen Europe is um, trying to enable a zero emission society. So we have uh, approximately 200 members coming from very different uh, sectors. Uh, approximately 10% of our members are from for, or from the oil and gas sector, but we also have a lot of uh, fuel cell providers, um, people from the transport sector, of course, the, the people that are producing uh, the hydrogen and also the green hydrogen in the future, because there's not, there's not that much at this stage. So we're trying to, from all those angles, all these different uh, um, perspectives and, and industry um, industries to, to facilitate transition to hydrogen economy. Uh, we have an intelligence unit, which is quite important, which is also becoming bigger and bigger, that has developed this, this model looking into what are the options, uh, 
uh, which type of fuel um, uh, is the most interesting for, for ships, for different ship types. So I myself come from the, I'm from the advocacy team, but it's, it's actually this type of work, the technical work, uh, the model that, uh, and the results that feed into the policy debate, or that will feed into the, the policy debate, because we also are developing uh, policy positions uh, because we need, we think the EU should be more ambitious when it comes to policy than it is now. Uh, a central observation, so except for biofuels and batteries, all zero emission and, and, and carbon neutral fuels that are envisaged are made from hydrogen. So regulating greenhouse gas emissions uh, and change of fuel will of course create a demand for hydrogen. And uh, we think that shipping regulation will be one of the short term end users regulation triggering the H2 economy. So it is of our interest or it is in the interest of the hydrogen sector to push for the EU to be more ambitious. And also an imp important in this regard is that we need to ensure that regulation is not used to favor LNG as a fuel and or biofuels as a short-term solution, postponing uh, uh, the, the rest. So we have a maritime working group dealing with uh, several uh, issues. Uh, several, so we have four pillars. The first pillar being the technical economic work, which I will explain uh, very briefly uh, later on. Then we have the policy making. Then we work also on innovation and funding, trying to bring parties together to look into uh, funding opportunities, uh, specifically focusing, of, of course, on ships and then technical regulation. Um, so Hydrogen Europe has developed this, this technical economic comparison tool, looking, looking into different fuel options for different ship types. Uh, we have, of course, the, um, the liquid hydrogen, um, the compressed hydrogen LOHC is also in there. Uh, ammonia, uh, the blue and the gray version, and we also look at the green uh, hydrogen fuels, of course. Um, and imp an important element in this regard is, of course, in the model that we look at the loss of cargo space. If you look at different fuels, of course, the loss of cargo space is a very important element for the different ship types. Uh, to look at the cost of the tanks is also in the model. And in the case you need reformers, for example, for LOHC, we also have uh, those elements integrated in the model. When it comes to the power, it was mentioned before, uh, fuel cells um, are a very interesting option, certainly for the smaller ships. It's more complex for the bigger ships, uh, except for auxiliary power, of course. Uh, and that's also something we look at. Uh, what is the potential of internal combustion engines? Recently, uh, there was the launch of, of an engine from um, a Belgian ship owner, together with a Belgian engine maker, that can burn uh, hydrogen together with diesel. It's a 20% it's a uh, uh, diesel uh, pilot injection and 80% hydrogen. Uh, but they will also go for single fuel hydrogen uh, internal combustion engines, which is quite an interesting development we need to, to, to monitor as well. So these are the first, and you can see on the slide that these are the emerging conclusions. I mean, it's a living tool. Uh, there's nothing uh, cut in stone here. But um, if you look, there's two important elements we, we need to look at. The distance between bunkering, how many times do the ships need to bunker, uh, and also the, the, the main engine power, the propulsion power. So you can see here on, on this, this, uh, this slide for the smaller ships, compressed uh, are quite an interesting option. And we do see projects also involving in this regard. We do see small ships at this stage uh, going for compressed uh, uh, from tube trailers, uh, Etc. And then for the bigger ships, liquid could become an interesting solution. But I think for the for the larger segment, which is also what the models from from uh, UMass and DVGL have been looking at as well, um, ammonia seems to be uh, seems to have quite a, a big potential. Um, we will because this is a very brief explanation, of course, on this, this uh, comparison tool, but we will uh, publish uh, a report on, on, on this tool with a lot of details in it on, on, regarding the assumptions. And also this will be accompanied by a maritime vision paper. How does either Europe sees the transition of um, the maritime sector towards hydrogen or, hyd or hydrogen-based uh, fuels? And this will be published as well in November 2020. So the conclusions from, from the, the comparison tool, and, and this is a mix of, of technical and, and the policy position because the lifetime of the ships, um, we think highlights the urgency of enrolling hydrogen as a fuel as soon as possible. And to, to avoid that the fleet renewal of the next years will include too many fossil fuel uh, ships. Uh, we have looked at the available technology, the strengths and the weaknesses, uh, the, the TRL level to propose deployment scenarios for ships and also the infrastructure. 
And when it comes to fuel production costs alone, pure hydrogen options are always cheaper than fuels that require further transformation, regardless of the electricity price. And we found that for the larger ships, ammonia, ammonia is the cheapest uh, synthetic fuel based on renewable hydrogen. And uh, in this regard, since ammonia uh, seems to have quite a big potential, uh, we also see, of course, or think that more research needs to be done on uh, the issue of ammonia slip, uh, the NTO emissions. And in this regard, I think we can learn from what happened in the past with, for example, LNG, when at a certain point in time, uh, the focus was very much also on greenhouse gas emission in the world and, and uh, the methane slip. Uh, we can learn from this, uh, this experience. So on the bottom, you can see that the fuel cost increases if you go towards the, the e-fuels. But it's a, it's a bit of a trade-off. Right? If you go to e-fuels, the ammonia, the LNG, other, other e-fuels, the energy, the energy density improves, of course. Hence also the, the loss of cargo space uh, improves. So it's a bit of a trade-off between those things. Um, and that's very briefly a short explanation on, on what we have been doing so far with regards to the bubble. And I might go into this at a, at a later stage if, uh, if there are questions in, in, in this, uh, this regard. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ludovic. Uh, thanks to all of our speakers for, for offering your insights. Um, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we've had a, a couple of interesting questions coming from the panel. Um, so one of them was asking, uh, you know, are we looking at a um, uh, modeling from the perspective of the getting to zero coalition and uh, and uh, building our own model and, and the answer to the short answer to that is is yes and I'm going to ask Tristan to talk a, a couple minutes about that maybe, maybe we'll save that for the end um, there were have been quite a few questions around the um, carbon uh, CO2 versus uh, other emissions and uh, a couple of those have been answered in the chat but maybe I'll um, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Alexandra, because um, I, I saw that you answered uh, one of those, just kind of the role of modeling and the role of kind of single emissions versus multiple emissions, how we're modeling and what are the unknowns there? So, sorry, Randall, do you want me to cover the emissions first or Tristan for the uh, modeling? Uh, no, we'll do. We'll come back to Tristan for the modeling at okay, the end of this. Sorry. But we'll start with the mission. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Yes. So, so basically, I, I think as uh, Ludwig mentioned, uh, you always have to consider the whole environment. You know, thinking about LNG, when it was put in into effect, the main drivers were NOx emissions. You know, LNG has very low air uh, air pollutants, but when you then optimize the engine, you have a trade off between methane emissions and NOx emissions, for example, or the energy efficiency. And if you just select on one uh, scenario only, you basically cause problems the other way around. So when you are considering especially the, uh, the concerns you have between global shipping, you know, far away from the coast, and especially in, in port, you get different drivers and, and different, and the preferred solution is, of course, to address everything. And what you need, as, as Joe was mentioning, you also need to consider any other options you have to actually reduce emissions. Um, a diesel particulate filter doesn't work with HFO, but it would work probably with other fuels. So, you know, so we need to consider a whole solution, but I think um, it is important to keep that in mind, but also keep in mind that for a lot of these uh, applications, whether you have an ICE or a fuel cell, it's actually at the moment not that well known how much the emissions are and how much it will cost to reduce them. So that's another uncertainty to consider. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, on that question of uncertainties, um, and I heard some of this reflected in, in, in the panel remarks, but this idea that, of course, there are a lot of uncertainties and the goal of a model is to reduce those uncertainties, but it won't do so completely. Um, and in that process, obviously, we are using assumptions and, and each of these models, as Tristan pointed out in his uh, comparative analysis, that there's, there's some variability. Um, maybe one question just uh, so people can understand better, you know, what would we say are the, are the key drivers of variability across the, the different models? And, and Tristan, you focused um, a, a little bit on this, so maybe you can start and then, and then maybe Tora to, re to respond. 
Yes, I'm happy to do that. And I hope you don't mind me just sticking another slide back up because I tried to sort of think through these in summary. Um, I mean, the one that is very obvious is the technology cost and efficiency assumptions. And as Alexandra said in her slide, slides at the very beginning, how they evolve yes, over time. Future proofing and none of these, none of these things are static. So obviously we know what certain pieces of equipment might cost today, but if they get taken up in large volume, either within shipping or wider parts of the society, um, fuel cells being one obvious example, then their costs will, will evolve. Um, that's one key source of variability. And I've also suggested that how we handle that is just to be very transparent about those assumptions so that people reading our respective reports and analyses can understand exactly what we've used as an input assumption, whether we to their perspective, we've been optimistic or pessimistic or um, whatever. The next one, which I think is a driver of variability is, is, is the question that is also related to the air pollution issues that Alexandra was just co commenting about, which is what do we assume about the cost or maturity of handling byproduct greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution species? So for ammonia, the obvious one is NOS uh, or nitrous oxide, um, but you also have um, nitrogen oxide, NOx, and ammonia slip that would need to be handled. For hydrogen and combustion, you would also have NOx as an issue. And um, the, the first thing that we do in our modeling is to make sure that we include, um, even though these are uncertainties, we include an assumption that we would need some exhaust treatment. So we would include exhaust treatment capital cost and, uh, in, and operating cost in most of our models to represent the fact that we would have some exhaust treatment. But that, that will remain uncertain and it will remain variable between different models about how that has been handled um, and whether or not there's been any cost increase uh, because of that. Another one is to do with the cost of managing safety for different fuels and machinery, which is slightly different from the emission species problem. Um, and again, you can add in a sort of working assumption today and be transparent about it and then as we get experience from trials, we might be able to refine those or understand whether some people's models had been optimistic or conservative on that particular assumption. And then the, the final one is about input prices. And this is, I mean, I wish I could just put an extra graph up here because if you take electricity price as one example, I mean, in, in the last few years, it's done 10% per annum reduction on global aggregate wholesale price. It's, it's obviously having an extraordinary revolution um, as we as renewables penetrate the grid. And um, that that is uncertain as to how it will continue, but you can get to some very, very different future scenarios for the economic viability of green fuels um, produced using electricity and hydrolysis. Uh, if you if you project a 10% per annum increase for the next 10 years or a flattening out of that cost reduction because we hit some sort of physical limit. So, so there are a lot of variabilities that arise in the models. And then obviously the one that we've also mentioned, the biofuel availability and price issue is key. Whether or not the model assumes any constraint on supply or not can have fundamentally different impacts on the outputs. Um, again, I, I think the best way to handle that is just to be very um, transparent, but also to be very good at deriving feedstock assumptions wherever possible from coherent analyses. And my criticism of the IEA's work and others who work in this space is that they tend to look purely at energies decarbonisation. When we decarbonise society, we have to decarbonise every source of anthropogenic CO2. That includes sectors like agriculture, which IEA do not consider. And if you were to add them in, they place a much greater burden on the sectors like shipping and the energy system, other modes of transport that have potential to go to zero. So uh, not only does that have an impact on the availability of feedstocks, um, but it also has an impact on the um, stringency that we have to look at any transport mode decarbonizing at. So having in assumptions coherently derived from a global economy decarbonization perspective is really important. Thanks, Tristan. And, and, and I think you touched on one of the differences between uh, between between the model you've been doing and uh, Tour uh, has been doing uh, just in terms of the biofeedstocks tour. You were saying you don't uh, predict the uh, put in li limits on those, you kind of assume that. So maybe just your comment on the on some of the variabilities and where those might come from. Then we'll go to some of the other questions that have been coming. So um, I think I, I will just echo, you know, first I will echo uh, Tristan's um, comments. Um, all the assumptions that we do as particular on, on the fuel uh, and the technology development, how will they mature, how and when will they mature? I think those are you know, critical to answer. And you know, whether you have an ammonia engine in 2025 or 2030, uh, and whether there will be available infrastructure and fuel to have a full scale uptake uh, is, is going to make it or break it. And 
that's kind of the, one of the dilemmas we had when we started working on this year's study. What, what is it a model to predict what will happen? Uh, or is it a model to kind of outline the different pathway and what does it take to, to, to go there? And with the given uncertainties, we don't really know when technologies will mature. Uh, it's very hard to kind of make a, a model to, to work on that because it, it will anyway be a part of our assumptions. So the model will just predict what we, uh, we have uh, assumed in the first place. So, so I think our model and our study is, is geared towards what's, what does it take? How quickly does it have to go? When, when and how much of the different fuels uh, do you need? And also to see the uh, dynamics based on different prices, different um, policies, uh, timing, uh, and so on. Also, one, a couple of other comments. Um, we, are all, we were also very focused, what do you do today? Because we don't have any solutions today. So there is a gap of, and here we, uh, I, I'm not sure we disagree, but uh, uh, the optimistic could be five years, uh, pessimistic, pessimistic view could be 10 to 15 years before you have a full scale uh, or uptake and availability of a different fuel. So what do you do uh, in between? Uh, and also that's, since we are a class society, we have a lot of uh, ship owners that ask us that question. So that's, that's kind of also a fundamental um, question we, we um, try to ask in the study. And finally, what, what's, what's the, um, what do we use these studies for? Uh, then, okay, we, we, we predict ammonia and methanol. Okay, what then? Uh, for, for policy makers, for, for, for ship owners who want to take a decision, what, what's the means? Uh, if we suddenly see that uh, it's, it's going to be ammonia, ammonia is going to be the thing, how, how do we, what do we do with that? And I think, uh, at least personally, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of putting all the eggs in one basket because, okay, we could say, figure out, it's, it's ammonia, and we go all in ammonia, and then we suddenly know, oh, some unintended consequences. We are not able to, to deal with the nitrous oxide, and then so I think for a moment, there, there aren't, we need to be very broad. We have to investigate a lot of things. I think also we need to be very, figure out what, what's the criteria? What, what's sustainable? What, what's, what's the criteria for a biofuel? What's the criteria for a blue fuel or a uh, electrofuel um, to take, uh, how do we deal with NOx, SOx, particles, uh, land use? You name it. A lot Thanks. of kind of disjointed uh, points here, but uh, it's... Uh... No, but it, well, you point out a couple of things. I mean, one of them is that we can't model everything. And there have been some questions that have come in on uh, uh, related to safety and policy. And Ludovic, I'm going to turn to you for this one. In terms of, you know, what about the things that we can't model? Um, you, you, you're, you have a background in policy. How do we model policy? Does policy get modeled or do we do scenarios such as DNV has done? What's, what's the best way to approach that to try to kind of bring some certainty to these, to these unknowns? Because of course, they will affect and impact our, our cost of ownership. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, um, the model that we, we developed, of course, looks into the, the, the different options um, for hydrogen, hydrogen based fuels for, for ships, purely looking at the technical parameters, of course. Eh? So it gives indications, as I said, for the smaller fleet, for the smaller segments. Uh, meaning really uh, it's, it's intra-EU shipping and, the, and, and, and even inland shipping, we do see a potential, as I, as I mentioned, for compressed hydrogen. So we have uh, identified different categories of, sh of ship types where you, know, you, have, you have certain potential, but you need to do it in a stepwise approach. If you look at this slide, the category one vessel, um, that's where, from our perspective, the potential is the, is the biggest for compressed hydrogen. So inland ships, survey vessels imports, uh, urban ferries, those ships where you can actually start developing also the supply chain that is needed on a small scale, of course, where you will have bunkering stations, not only for ships, but also other applications on, uh, application on land. People need to see this happening. And it's not necessarily in, in, the, in the bigger ports, it's also in, in, in the smaller ports, uh, where even maybe the potential to develop those supply chains is, is, is even higher. 
So if you then look at the category two ships, it's not necessarily the main engine power, it's, it's for auxiliary power. There is a potential for fuel cells uh, in this regard. Uh, and then at a certain point, you go to, to four with three in between, that's the bigger ships. And for the bigger ships, if you look at main engine power, of course, fuel cells are, are not an option, certainly not at this stage and will take many years. And then you go to internal combustion engines. And that's where the big question is I mean, uh, for, for the ship owners that will, or the ships that will conti can continue to use IC, will it be methanol, will it be ammonia? Uh, the ferry industry, the cruise sector is not interested that, that much in, in ammonia because of the safety uh, issues. Also, when discussing this all, I mean, the, the potential of e-fuels, you have the, um, the, the sustainability, the scalability and storability. And it's the storability element that, that we find quite important. We do hear reports saying that uh, to, to, to store additional amounts of ammonia, for example, imports, and I'm saying additional because there's already the fertilizer industry that is using that. Uh, it's not that easy to find uh, the necessary space to store it, let alone, of course, to produce it because of the toxicity of the fuel. So we need to take that into consideration as well, not dismissing the fact that it, ha it has a big potential for ships, of course. So it's, you know, the ship shore interface, how will ports deal with storing, et cetera, et cetera, need, that needs to, take, to be taken into consideration. But the conclusion of this is we are looking at the, the smaller ships first to develop the supply chains and see where we can go from there. Um, so, okay, that's a quick, quick response. No, thank you, Ludovic. And, and it, it also highlights something um, about the Getting to Zero Coalition. The Getting to Zero Coalition is, is looking at uh, deep sea. So obviously the larger end of those ships and, and there's definitely a need for an ecosystem approach. And that's a lot of these things will be tested on, you know, a hydrogen tug. I think it, I can remember it was Port of Antwerp or Port of Rotterdam that was doing that. But there's, so there's a lot of small scale things that are happening and those are definitely prerequisites before you can take something and put it into, you know, a large, uh, a larger deep sea you know, Panamax ship. Um, there was uh, there's a question here that uh, about the, the lifetime expectancy of, of 20 to 30 years for infrastructure. And uh, obviously, if we're in a time of significant technological change, um, the solutions, as, um, as has already been alluded to, the solutions that are available now are certainly going to be different in five years and in 10 years and beyond. Um, so this was a question from Martin Kraft. Uh, given the lack of proven technology today, major changes in propulsion and auxiliary systems and the fuels um, you know, are to be expected during the, during the life expectancy of the hull, of the outside of the ship. Um, how do we deal with that? I'll, I'll just kind of open that up. Maybe Alexander, you can start, because how do we deal with that from a ship owner perspective? And then how do we deal with that, Tristan, from, from, or, or Tori, from a, from a modeling perspective? Uh, could you just uh, repeat that? I had a bit of a hiccup in my... No, it's fine. It's, uh, the question was from Martin Kraft, and it was saying, given the, proven, uh, the, the lack of proven technologies today, as in many of the technologies that we've been talking about are yet uh, to be delivered in a ship, for example, there are no ammonia engines running in ships, um, changes to the propulsion and auxiliary systems uh, and their fuels are expected to happen during the next 20, 30 years, during the life expectancy of a, of a vessel. How do, we, how do we deal with that and take that into account? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's similar with regard to the, the cost of uh, producing a green fuel because you don't, you're not manufacturing it at the moment. Um, it's, it's challenging because we basically you have to, to match from a fuel producing point of view, the demand with, with, the, um, with the development. And you have to take into account that your first demonstration plants may have a lower lifetime and, and a more limited lifetime, or you have to consider how you actually upgrade it and, and, and improve it uh, with regard to adapting and, and making it more efficient. When we're looking at, just to give an example, uh, Shell, pioneered uh, the um, GTL, which is gas to liquid technology. So we moved that from um, a demonstration, you know, from a very small plant, you know, to, to prove it to our first plant in Bintulu, uh, which basically generated the first, um, uh, you know, to prove the concept. And it, it's, it's quite a large plant. And then we built Bur Pearl, which was like an 18 billion um, uh, development in Qatar. But Bintulu is continuing to work but it's focusing on different products and, and different. So you have to also consider 
can you actually make it into niche? Can you can you uh, work it as a research facility, etc.? So you you know so yeah, it is a challenge, but it can be addressed by really thinking in the heart about what you want to achieve. The first plants would be seen more as research facilities, uh, which then have a continued life with experimenting with different technologies or producing different products, and then going on for more of a commercialization. So it's a challenge, but it can be addressed. Uh, thanks, Alexander. Tristan, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, so, so first, I mean, we have a number of different models, and the one that I've talked about here is just about what's the comparative total cost of operation for a number of different options. So we don't look at the transition pathway. Where that question is particularly relevant is where you do evaluate the transition pathway. And in those, what we allow is for the fleet to be looked at at every time step of the modeling and the consideration, do I retrofit to a different fuel? Do I continue to use my current fuel or a drop in to that spec? Do I fit technologies? Do I look at different speeds? Because all of those can help reduce your carbon intensity. So given an objective that you're working to, you can find from that family of options the, the cost optimal um, solution. And I would say that when we do that and we set a decarbonization trajectory, what you get is a lot of fuel retrofit in the 30s. So we have early adopters coming in, in the late 20s who go for zero solutions but then you start to get a lot of the incumbent fleets, sometimes the five and 10 year olds in the 2030s, in fact, mostly the five and 10 year olds because retrofitting an old ship often doesn't make any sense for return on capital. Um, then the younger ships get retrofitted in the 30s. And there the key assumption is about what the flexibility of full retrofit is and obviously what the cost is. And um, the key component there is actually emerging as the fuel storage. Most of the engine manufacturers are saying, we can probably sell you a retrofit kit in about 10 years time, or even sooner, that you would be able to use to take one of the existing conventional monofuel engines, like an MEC engine from MAN, and convert it into an ammonia engine, or a methanol engine, or something else. The bit that you would then need to solve is where do I put the fuel tank if you've designed a conventional ship, and, and how do I upgrade the handling system for the, for the engine space itself? Um, but also for the supply of the fuel. And that could obviously be quite a re an expensive retrofit. And we have lots of experience now from LNG retrofit supplied for LNG ready ships that have been very expensive. So, so I guess from a modeling perspective, we can bring it in and we do, and it's quite scary about the ships built this decade that they would need flexibility if we are going to be on a decarbonization trajectory. From an industry perspective, I don't necessarily see that the 20 to 30 year assumption needs to change if we can build ships this decade that have the flexibility in particular that look out for the storage um, modification and there are ship owners who are building ships to that spec today if you look at what bw are doing for example fitting at least on a blgc which has an advantage because it's a um, already kind of heading in the ammonia direction being an lpg carrier that's a, a ship which uh, they've recently launched that has an lgip engine which is man's LPG burning engine easily convertible to ammonia according to their sales literature at least and then looked at the storage system that they would need to adopt if they wanted to retrofit to ammonia so it's not that one couldn't do it but there is a capital premium associated with that and there is an opportunity cost and and all of that obviously needs to be built into some of the strategy. Thank you Tristan and, and I think that's important that idea of, of building these elements in um, the idea of retrofitability future proofing um, and understanding which ships uh, that uh, that might add to there were um, there were, which ships that might apply to rather there were a couple of questions in the chat related to getting to zero um, and modeling and uh, um, you know of course the answer to that is funny you should ask um, so this is this is a, a key element of the getting to zero fuels work. The modeling itself has not uh, yet started, but it's been uh, in debate for six months. It's had some delays due to coronavirus. But um, maybe Tristan, I can I can let you um, offer a couple of comments about what we're aspiring to do, and then I'll come back to the panel for a final question around um, a, a lot of uh, when we talk about our modeling, when we talk about our total cost of ownerships, we we kind of pitch this with lots of caveats in terms of uh, the uncertainties and everything else. But I think a lot of people on the call um, uh, or on the webinar are, are exploring, you know, okay, so what, uh, what are the decisions that we can make? What are, what are the things that we know that we can rule out? Um, so that'll be kind of our final question. I'll give uh, people a moment to think about that, except for you, Tristan, because I'm going to have you talk a little bit about the model that we're looking at um, uh, within the fuels and technologies uh, work just for, uh, just for two minutes. Yes, so there is a... There is an ongoing conversation and it's it's reassuring to see that that was something that this 
audience has suggested might also be useful from the question. There's an ongoing conversation to see if we can develop something which is more transparent and more available than the work that's been done so far. I think a lot of organisations, including ours, have relied on writing reports, but, but sort of keeping the model to ourselves. I think we would like, as an aspiration within the group, to, to democratise some of that modelling, to make the tools themselves available, to allow people in the industry to play with some of the input assumptions and, and tune the model to their preference or their uh, fleet specifics or their, their um, commercial business case specifics, and then explore what that then tells them rather than have to read a report that has been written with the author's presumptions and um, and sort of perspective on numbers and generic business case fleet assumptions. So uh, that's an ongoing effort. It would require both um, finding a way to put some of the existing models in a form that was easily usable and didn't just mean, mean that we spent our lives on the phone or email answering people's technical support queries and also a, a process to pool and gather a, a sort of a nicely distributed set of input assumptions from a wide range of stakeholders so we can say for some of the values that you might want inputs on if you're not an expert and you don't have a preference you might want to choose from this range or this is um, a broad consensus value or this is the range of values that that we seem to be able to ex, uh, sort of define at this point in the process. Uh, so it's not a trivial exercise that's one of the reasons why it's taking so long and it needs a lot of consideration about who the end users might be and what the criteria that need to be evaluated and how to make this manageable thank you tristan and uh, yes we've we've set ourselves a, a a lofty goal i think the idea of open sourcing and having that transparency is is very interesting um it's not unprecedented the actual the modeling by the hydrogen europe group um is is actually open and they've actually offered for us to be able to kind of use that. So there, there's definitely some, some link ups there. Um, but this idea of if everybody's doing modeling and coming up with different result, results, is there kind of that one model to end all models? And, and, you know, it's not easy. So first of all, to build it is a large and complex process, but also to get everybody to agree that, that they would kind of leave modeling behind as a competitive advantage, not completely, but you know, it's, it, it, it's a different space and it's a different shift for those that, uh, that provide services in that space. So, um, We've got three minutes left, and I and I and I just want to kind of. Uh, we've heard a lot of really interesting insights about what models can tell us, um, uh, what we what we what we know, what we don't know. Um, uh, a good bit of the conversation around some of that variability um, and uh, and why things are different, why we're not getting the same answers out of uh, out of different models, which is which is at this stage, as has been pointed out, it's probably a good thing. You know, we we do need to look uh, at a range of different assumptions. We do need to look at all the different technologies. Um, but that said, there are some things that we do know. Um, Tristan, when you pointed out the kind of uh, convergence across three different models, at least, um, where there's some overlap. So uh, I'd like to just kind of turn to our panel. I'll go uh, Ludovic, Tora, um, uh, Tristan, and then Alexandra to just, kind of, what do we, what is it from, uh, from all of this that we can take away? And what are the decisions that we can make now, um, knowing the, the, the total, lost, uh, total cost of ownership? Ludovic, to you. Yeah, as I, I think I mentioned before, a model is, is still is still still uh, just a model. I think the conclusion here is a bit that okay, everything depends on the assumptions, etc. So what, what what we are trying to do with the model that we have developed, and as you said, it's an open model. It's it's uh, it's open to anyone who wants to comment on it, and it's it's, it's uh, we have been very transparent in this process. But we we are looking, you know, at a stepwise approach to the uptake of, of alternative fuels. Uh, I know that the, the gain to zero coalition is all about how to have the transition of, of uh, intercontinental shipping to, to, to go to uh, zero emission fuels. But I think it's important to to and then certainly from a EU perspective, not the EU centric, but from a EU perspective, to see where, where the potential lies in this regard for the for the for the for the, the, the for example inter EU ships. Uh, inland ships. How can we develop? And again, I'm emphasizing this: the supply chains at a small scale in the ports, small ports as well, uh, to, to, for the people to understand to see what is happening in this regard. Uh, and yeah, the conclusion from our model is: yeah, first start with compressed, maybe even liquid. Also, the potential fuel cells versus internal combustion engines, also for the small segments, uh, is an, will be an interesting debate, and we will facilitate discussions soon. We will have roundtable discussions about this also open to anyone who wants to participate uh, in this regard and then see from there 
Uh, but we do think uh, at, at, at a certain point, uh, we need to look into having more transparency and, and, and more uh, clarity on, on what is the potential fuel for, for larger ships. And there we do see ammonia being, uh, being coming up as, as, a, as a most interesting, uh, interesting one. Thanks, Ludovic, and uh, an offer there to um, be part of that process as well. Tora, to you. Thank you. And um, I think the model is, modeling itself is interesting, but all the, the byproducts of what we're doing is, is probably uh, also the key how we identify what we need to understand better because we identify gaps. This we don't really understand. Uh, flexibility was something we kind of alluded to last year and which we investigated even further that kind of last year's experience told us that okay this is what we need to dive into deeper and based on the feedback this year um, we probably also have to go further into the, the fuel production uh, the flexibility will will remain an issue um, also how to accelerate and uh, you know what do we do today i think that that's that's important so for me that's that's the most important part of the modeling and also i think it's it's a very good benefit that we have multiple models that can we can use to compete compare uh see okay where does this take us um and lastly i think we also work in the from the other end uh in the end, you need to build a business case for a ship owner to invest in and take up uh, alternative fuels. And in, in the other end, you have to kind of start small, start with piloting, uh, developing infrastructure. But the other end, you see how do you get to uh, that business case? And the modeling can help you to, to figure out which of these, uh, what are the key gaps that you need to cover. Great, thank you, Tora. Um, I realize that we're going over time. So Tristan and Alexander, if you could be brief in your, in your final comments, that would be wonderful, thanks. Tristan? I'm gonna take Dominic Tusker's comment in the Zoom chat, um, that maybe it's time to try and answer the uncertainties, and do more modeling. I mean, there are some things that we will remain known unknowns, like the availability of biofuel in 20 years time relative to other sectors demands for it. There are other things that we have that we can answer. And that means full scale trials, that means pilots. And the sooner we get on with that, the sooner we can then start to refine yeah. those assumptions within the models and say, right now we've, we, you know, we could do more modeling now, but I don't think it's, it's besides democratizing it, it's gonna be as useful as if we can get on with some, some scale trials. That's a great answer, Tristan. Thank you. And Alexander, to you. Yes. Just basically to, to add to what Tristan is saying, uh, Shell, we are, starting the sea trials of our first liquid hydrogen carrier. You know, it's generating the data to actually go into the model. And I would just say people need to keep an open mind. There's so much uncertainty, there's so much overlap. We just need to refine the models and don't be surprised if, you know, next year you get different information again. It's just because we need to generate the data. Everybody is waiting for the ammonia trial in an internal combustion engine to actually get the data on that one as an example. So, you know, data is key for further development. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to all our participants who have joined us and especially for those who stayed with us uh, through to the end. Um, thank you very much to all of our panelists, um, Alexander Ebbinghaus from Shell, Tristan Smith from UCL, Ludovic Lafreniere from Hydrogen Europe and Tori Lungva from DNV. And uh, thank you um, to the partners of the Getting to Zero Coalition, the Global Maritime Forum, the World Economic Forum and the Friends of Ocean Action for making this happen. I hope you'll join us next time. We will be working on a summary and answering the questions that didn't get answered on the panel. And uh, thanks again, and I look forward to moving forward together. Thank you.